everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. Let's go ahead and get started. This is First Lady Lucy Hayes live stream history program with Andrew Oak. Happy Sunday. Thanks for joining us. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you want to tell us, oops, hold on one second. Okay, there we go. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So in the Zoom chat in Q&A, or if you're in, watching on Facebook, you can type in the comments. We always welcome people to tell us their first name, where they're connecting from, and your favorite first lady. It's always interesting to know where people are joining us from and learn about people's preferences. So just a strictly optional exercise if you want to participate. And again, you can type that in the chat or the Q&A feature in Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook, your first name, where you're connecting from, and your favorite first lady, which interestingly enough, the fa favorite first lady question always really, the answer always really varies a lot from uh, tour to tour or presentation to presentation. And then for those of you watching on Zoom, we don't have time to do a Zoom demonstration, but just real quick, a few things that people want to know how to do or learn more about is everyone except the presenter, Andrew and myself will be in listen only mode or muted. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you should check the settings locally on your device. We did a sound test earlier. Everything seems to be working fine. The screen and video display on Zoom, if it's the slides that we're showing, if they don't take up the full screen, you can look for something either called view or view options, which is usually at the top of a person's device. And you can click the side-by-side -side mode, which will change the display for that. Um, throughout our program today, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type those in the chat in the Q&A in Zoom or in the comment section of Facebook. And when Andrew's done with his presentation, um, we'll actually go through some of those questions. So thank you for your participation. For those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. We used to do all of these in-person programs uh, throughout the Washington, D.C. area. In fact, one of our most popular programs is an in-person tour of the First Ladies exhibit at the Smithsonian American History Museum. But of course, um, that's on hold because of COVID, but we'll start that back up at some point in time. And this is actually the third time that Andrew has presented to our group. But before we dive into that, um, I'm the person currently talking, your host. My name is Robert Kellerman, and I'm the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. And again, we've had Andrew come present to our group. This is the third time. So the first time was really fascinating. He gave basically an overview of the first lady's kind of role throughout history. Um, and this was a couple months ago, back in January. And then last month he came and joined us and gave a presentation on Abigail Adams, which was very fascinating. Now, the thing is, if you were not able to join us for either of those two programs, don't worry because we have recordings of them on our YouTube page. So we've started to record as many of the programs that we do as possible. We can't record all of them for various technical reasons. Um, but if you'd like to check out Andrew's previous two presentations. Um, they're on our YouTube page. I'll post the YouTube link in the chat on Zoom and in the comments on Facebook. Um, and then I'll also email it out later on to those that actually signed up. And next month, uh, looking ahead, Andrew's presentation is going to be on First Lady Lou Hoover. Uh, she was the wife of President Herbert Hoover, and we're really kind of committed to learning more about other First Ladies. We've done a lot of programs on Jacqueline Kennedy and Eleanor Roosevelt and Martha Washington, and I think it's really helpful to kind of learn um, more about some of these other First Ladies that maybe aren't as well known as Jacqueline Kennedy. So again, uh, next month will be First Lady Lou Hoover, and I'll put the information on that a little bit later. But today, we're going to be talking about Lucy Hayes. So how we ended up uh, choosing these first ladies is Andrew and I were having just kind of a casual discussion. I asked him who his first favorite first ladies were. Um, and he said, well, it kind of depends by century. Um, he's like in the kind of the 1700s, early 1800s. I like Abigail Adams. And then, you know, he mentioned some of the other ones. So we thought, hey, we should do programs for these. So here we are. So we're going to learn about Lucy Hayes. And again, at the end, um, of Andrew's presentation, we can take some questions and comments. And so with that, let me turn things over to author, and historian, and friend, Andrew Oak. So Andrew, take it away. It's all yours. Okay, Robert. Well, you've done, as always, an excellent job of setting this up, setting up how we uh, 
how we come to to be in each other's company and um and and the discussions and and it it, it it really was an organic way that it came through as this whole project has developed. My name is Andrew Oak and I am the first lady's man. Um, I call myself the first lady's man because I was a series producer for C-SPAN series, First Ladies Influence and Image that they did in partner with the White House Historical Association. At the end of this series, there was still so much that ended up on the edit room floor, so much from my travels um, that I decided to write books and do speeches because the appetite for this material, the appetite for knowledge and stories about these women was just so voracious. Everywhere I went, people wanted to hear more and more and more. And everything that I couldn't fit in, that we couldn't fit in to the series, then became part of the books. And then speech by speech by speech, we're getting these out here. And you're right, you know, in the in the uh, 17, early 1800s, Abigail Adams is my favorite. And in the 1800s of the 19th century, Lucy Hayes is always one that pops up and is a favorite for me. Um, the, 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 the show was, was a deep dive into each first lady and each first lady had their own, their own episode for the most part. Uh, my books are about my travels, about my adventures, the places I went, the people I met, the hotels where I stayed, the food that I ate. Uh, it became a travel log that was also this history lesson because these stories of these women are not very well known. Um, we know about their time in the White House and then in more modern first ladies, we know about their time after the White House and sometimes before. This is speaking very generally, of course, but for every first lady from Martha Washington to now Dr. Jill Biden, there's very few people out there that know a whole lot about all of them. And that's where I had the advantage of producing this series and traveling to every home, library, church, school, train station, general store, uh, every birthplace, cemetery, you know, and get every possible story that I could. And I couldn't even fit all that into the books. And I couldn't even get to all the places I've expanded since the series to get to more places and see more things to learn about these great women like Lucy Hayes. Now, before we start with Lucy Hayes, I do want to just rewind very quickly, um, there's where you can get my books. I, I should have hit that off at first, firstladiesman.com. This is where you can see the series, view the C-SPAN series, get all the information about me, all the information about other first ladies, interviews, articles, all kind of stuff, fairly interactive. Follow me on social media and all that good stuff for people that want to know. Now, I want to rewind a little bit and talk about George and Martha, just very briefly before we dive in. Whether Martha Washington wanted to be first lady or had aspirations of leadership or things like that, she married a man that would lead and win the revolution and become the first president of the United States. And it's kind of ironic because he couldn't have done that without her. Martha Washington was married before George and her first husband left her a widow at 26 with massive amounts of land in, in Williamsburg, uh, massive amounts of land outside of Williamsburg, tobacco plantations, wealth, physical wealth, silver, cash on hand. And she's 26 years old with four kids and she has to manage this. She's literally one of the first successful female CEOs of the colonies. And she is a, she, she's like the number one widow bachelorette in, in town in, in America. Uh, George Washington was an up and coming and very successful military leader. Uh, they met, they married, and he would have her come to nearly every of the 13 winter encampments of the Revolutionary War to help him, to advise him, to consult with him, to host massive gatherings of diplomatic importance uh, that, that led to the successful revolution of the colonies, which became America. And America in the modern world and our place in the modern world, the modern world is a very different place without George Martha Washington. And the fact that George Washington could not have done it without Martha Washington, obviously I expand on these thoughts and, and, and these theories more in my book, but it's just, it's just very clear and it's very fact. And this made me realize how significant these women were to the story. And that's when things really grew outside of the series where I thought there is a much bigger picture here. There's, there's much more to these women. There's before, during, and after the White House. So as we move and think about someone like Lucy Hayes, um, it's funny when Robert asked me, you know, who are some of your favorite first ladies? And he's not the first. Everyone always asks that question. Um, you know, Lucy struck me from the very beginning. She's a different kind of first lady. She's a different kind of 19th century woman. Um, she's comfortable in her own skin. 
this is a picture from uh, her White House years. And we can see uh, a hairstyle. We can see a very um, close crop neck uh, and ruffles type of style. Um, this wasn't viewed as very cosmopolitan when she got to Washington, D.C. But we also see this style of her as a young girl. I'll share some pictures of those in a minute. Basically, Lucy didn't change her style and she didn't let Washington change her style and she didn't let politics change her style or her viewpoints. Uh, Lucy was um, uh, part of the temperance movement. She did not drink alcohol for religious reasons. Um, she's part of one of the first sort of political plays that we know about openly uh, with temperance that I'll get to in a little bit as well. But she stood her ground beyond the criticism. She gave, she gave reverence to the, the first ladies that came before her, saying that they were far greater. She was humble. She threw these parties in Washington, D.C. without serving hard alcohol or rum punch. Wine was served, and people still had a good time. Now, I always say that if you can host a party and, 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 and throw a party in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of politicians and not serve hard alcohol, and people still have a good time and they speak very favorably of you as a hostess and your events, then you're doing something right. And when it comes to the temperance movement, she had both sides upset because she did serve one, because she did attend events where alcohol was served. She wasn't the poster child, but people tried to make her the poster child for temperance. Again, we'll get a little more into that uh, later. She had children, eight children, five of whom uh, lived to adulthood. So she lost children just like so many other people during that time. That devastated some people as well it should. And while she mourned those children, she didn't let it stop her life. She didn't let it inhibit uh, the way she treated her other family members. She continued to success. She represented her husband in the Civil War when she was a general's wife. She represented her husband in uh, when he was governor of Ohio and then again in the White House and after in the philanthropic causes that she supported. Veterans, the mentally ill, orphans, way ahead of her time and way ahead of the public's expectation of a first lady doing this. First ladies didn't have to do this. They don't have to do it now, technically. First Lady is a non-elected, non-paid role, which makes all of these women, from Martha to, Bi to, to Dr. Jill Biden, you know, th this, this makes them unusual for their time. They're not paid. They're not elected. There's no definition or job description. You're just the wife, the spouse of the man who happened to win the presidency. And as I said, fairly ironic, with the first and Martha, George couldn't have done it without her. And many of these presidents couldn't have done it without their wives. She's the first first lady to graduate from college with a college degree. She attended um, Ohio Wesleyan Prep, which was not um, uh, for women at the time, but she got an exception, got in there, and then finished at um, Wesleyan Female College in Cincinnati. As she wrote uh, numerous essays on um, social issues, religious issues, women's suffrage. She was a supporter of African Americans long before the Civil War, during the Civil War, and after the Civil War. All of this coming into Washington, D.C., not affected, not changed, not altered by politics for the most part. And not many people come into Washington, D.C. and leave the same person that they are. But Lucy did. And that's why she stands out for me, especially in a time when America was really trying to get itself back together after the Civil War, you know? Um, there was a lot going on, and Lucy was a calm and quiet and steadfast and confident, without being boastful, kind of beacon as an example in the White House. She once uh, wrote a, a, an essay that, that said something, this will show you the, the kind of girl that she was. It says, my mind is as strong as a man's, equal in all and superior in some. We see this in a lot of first ladies that they are naturally intelligent. They have aptitude, they have aspirations. That's why they hitch their wagons to these guys that are going places because if they're gonna get their thoughts out there or they're gonna make a difference or they're gonna matter in a world where they can't vote where they don't have education, not in the case of Lucy, um, can't own land, a, a lot of different things, uh, things that we're still struggling now with uh, gender equality and stuff like that. So these women all were unusual for their time, but some were transformative, like Lucy. And that's where I'm talking about these, these causes. I want to show you a couple of, there's, there's Lucy's White House portrait. 
That's her official White House port in a beautiful ruby red uh, gown that they have on display at the um, the uh, Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center and their uh, Spiegel Grove home in Fremont, Ohio, where I traveled to uh, visit and learn. Great friends there with uh, the director, Christy Weininger, uh, the former director, Tom, uh, uh, is, is great, Tom Culbertson, all of them. I just had a wonderful time um, uh, at Spiegel Grove. And this dress and this portrait were paid for and, and sponsored by a, to a uh, tolerance movement. Now, the tolerance movement was big after the Civil War. Uh, uh, people say that Lincoln was, was going to tackle this next. Um, but it's interesting to see that a group wanted to glom on and sort of take this woman who, again, she had just had this personal vow of temperance. She had a nickname, Lemonade Lucy. You know, um, uh, many people know that. It wasn't a mean nickname or anything like that, but, you know, the Grant administration was the golden age and after the Civil War and was just, you know, people swinging from the chandeliers and rum punches and whiskey and everyone had a good time. I would have loved to have gone to a party in the Grant administration. But some people say, many people say, that Lucy brought a dignity back to the White House and they did serve wine. She did go to events where alcohol was, Rutherford behaves drank, not to excess or anything crazy, but this upset the temperance movement. Yet she was upsetting the people that supported alcohol and the sale of alcohol and the taxing of alcohol and the revenue of alcohol. So again, in Washington, DC, if you've got both sides of an issue upset with you, you're probably doing the right thing and you're right there in the middle. Moderation, the truth lies somewhere in between. But um, this temperance issue was brought up, uh, 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 you know, throughout the, the, the Hayes administration as it, as it associated with Lucy. And she also received a lot of gifts. Um, and so this is where I found in my studies where we saw sides of groups, almost the early lobbyists, um, the political parties, the, 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 the sides of issues that were really trying to pay to play, you know? And I don't think L Lucy was doing anything wrong at the time or anything egregious to except that one group wanted to pay for a painting. Another group gave her curtains and things like that. We didn't have the rules and we weren't sticklers for his stuff as much as we were, but um, all indications say it was all just on the level and, and known and she committed to, to, to nothing to either and didn't give the political favors or nepotism and things that, that, that that you see that, that go on. Uh, one thing that she did get from, um, it was from the, uh, the Women's Christian Working Association. She got a book and I wanna read a quote out of that book. It was a book of signatures. Um, it's, it's fascinating. I, I've held the book. It's a beautiful leather bound book. They keep it at Spiegel Grove. Sarah Polk wrote in the book. Uh, she was also part of the temperance movement. Um, she saw she saw the ill effects of alcohol when she lived with her husband, James K. Polk, when he was Speaker of the House in Washington, D.C. It was a poker match, actually, kind of an interesting side story. Um, uh, James K. Polk would have uh, other congressmen, senators and, and put the politicians and, and, and power, power players of the, of the day over for a card game. And Sarah Polk was the hostess. This was in their private home. And they would play cards and they would drink. And she heard all these loose lips. And she said to um, then Speaker Polk, she said, we're not going to do this hard alcohol thing. I hear these guys. And, and if, you're the, if you're the clear headed one in the room, hearing all these guys talk about all this stuff that they probably shouldn't do, you know, uh, uh, loose, loosened up a little from, from alcohol. So Sarah Polk had done this. Francis Cleveland later, um, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, was uh, part of the temperance movement and didn't drink for religious reasons. Um, but this book was so uh, beautiful and beautifully bound. And um, one of the signatures was from Sam Clemens, who you may know as Mark Twain. And this is a, just, it's just, it's so Mark Twain, it's fantastic. This is the inscription in his original handwriting written in the book that I was able to hold at Spiegel Grove. It says, total abstinence is so excellent a thing that it cannot be carried to too great an extreme. In my passion for it, I even carry it so far as to totally abstain from total abstinence itself. And he signed it Samuel Clemens, Hartford, Connecticut. So wonderful. He, he is so passionate for abstinence that he will abstain from total abstinence itself. But, but this cause didn't, didn't this isn't the, the, the end all be all with Lucy. It was more just, a, again, a, a religious choice, a, a lifestyle. 
She had other causes that, that centered around the Civil War. Uh, her presence in the Civil War was akin to Martha Washington's presence in the Revolutionary War. Uh, she would travel to most of the winter encampments to, to stay with her husband, keep him company. Um, again, I mentioned she was an advocate for African-Americans before and after. Later in the White House, actually, she would be uh, the first lady who had the first African-American entertainer um, in the White House, which I find uh, interesting. Um, but during the Civil War, she saw death everywhere. Everyone did. Um, so coming out of the Civil War, she was an advocate and supporter of veterans, of uh, orphans of the Civil War, and mentally ill, which would be sort of a you know, they didn't have to be war veterans to be mentally ill, but sometimes that would coincide. Um, she would bring her sewing machine to each of these winter encampments. And there's an interesting story. A soldier had torn his uniform and two of his older compatriots said, well, there's a lady up on the hill and she's got a sewing machine and she sits in a tent and all she does is fix uniforms day in, day out. Well, that was Lucy Hayes. That's the wife of the general leading their regiment. She wasn't there to sew uniforms, but she brought her sewing machine with her. She was an excellent seamstress by all accounts. So the young soldier goes trucking up the hill with his torn uniform, walks into uh, Lucy Hayes' tent, knocks on the flap, I'm sure. Uh, hey, I've got my uniform here. To, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining his, his uh, soldier buddies who put him up to it, kind of behind the tree and sniggering and you know laughing. But I... And, and uh, she took the uniform and she sewed it. And he went back to his friends and he said, well, what happened when you went in the tent? She said, oh no, the lady was there with her sewing machine and she, she fixed my uniform, she, she mended my uniform. And, and this makes me smile and laugh in so many different ways because it was just Lucy by, by every account. If, asked, if someone asked her to do something, she did it. Now, later on after the Civil War, she's the wife of the governor. Rutherford B. Hayes was the governor of Ohio. She had seen so much tragedy, so much death, as everyone had during the Civil War. She saw it firsthand, though, as she went to these winter encampments, much like Martha Washington in the Revolutionary War. So then, as the wife of the governor, as the First Lady of Ohio, she took it upon herself to do what women were not doing at the time. She went into mental facilities, mental institutions, hospitals, veterans hospitals, um, orphanages, and saw horrible things but also saw wonderful things. She would then report this back to her husband. You know, this facility is very good. We need to do more of this. This facility is very bad. Uh, one organization even donated a painting in, 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 that hung in one of the orphanages that she supported in Ohio. Now it's in the, the parlor at Spiegel Grove. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting in a just fantastic gilded frame. It's uh, Lucy tending to a, a soldier. Um, and this was just so very Lucy. You know, everyone knew that she was there to help. Everyone knew that she was there to try and make a better life for people. After the Civil War, she would host numerous reunions and picnics for veterans of the Civil War, for orphans of the Civil War. She would have her husband's uh, regiment out, uh, William McKinley. President, uh, future President William McKinley would be part of that regiment and come and stay there, another Ohioan. Um, Ohitian, I believe it is. Um, uh, so she was just always doing for others, um, especially in the categories of the Civil War veterans, orphans and orphans of the Civil War and the mentally ill. Now this paves the way, this blazes the trail for people like Eleanor Roosevelt, for people like any modern day first lady, uh, Rosalind Carter, very uh, active with mentally ill, Nancy Reagan, just say no. Um, you know, you talk about temperance and alcohol abuse and substance abuse. My gosh, Betty Ford went through that publicly along with breast cancer. So this transformable woman, this transformative woman, Lucy Hayes, this first lady, would allow other women to transition those trails, those paths that she had blazed in philanthropic endeavors and doing good for other people, given this position she had been thrust into with no training, with no job role, with no election, other than the election of her husband and no pay. 
I want to show a couple other pictures before I get sidetracked here. There's another beautiful picture that just shows kind of Lucy's style. I, I, you know, I don't know what the actual style was that people were saying that she should have looked like or should have looked differently, but you see that hairstyle remains the same. The gown remains the same. There's Spiegel Grove. That's their home there in Fremont, Ohio. They love that front porch, just absolutely beautiful and a beautiful grounds there. Um, and there's Rutherford and Lucy uh, uh, after uh, the White House sitting on the beautiful front porch, which I had the opportunity to walk through. Just fantastic. I, I wish I was there now, especially on a nice sunny day. Um, they are entombed there. Um, I always like to when I go back to uh, these places. I have spoken back at um, at the Presidential Center there with my friends uh, Tom and Christy and their crowd gathered. A wonderful event. And I like to stop by and and just thank them, you know, thank them for their information. Thank them for sharing their lives with us. Thank them for being part of American leadership and especially the first ladies for being part of, of women's leadership. Um, there's young Lucy. I, I thought this was very, very important. Now you can see just a beautiful young girl, very pleasant, very soulful eyes and the same hairstyle and the same, the same basic you know, dress, a little less fancy, a little more age appropriate and things like that. But you can see where this woman did not change. I, 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 I strive to be that comfortable in, in my skin and, you know, just do what's right. Not because you're paid, not because you're elected, because it's cool. It's the right thing to do. It's, 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 it's bettering the human race, bettering the world around you. And Lucy really embraced this as sort of this satellite or surrogate role of a first lady that we've come to expect in modern times. You know, I mean, imagine if a first lady didn't have a cause. Dr. Jill Biden is working with um, uh, uh, veterans. Um, uh, Michelle Obama, let's move. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and nutrition. Uh, Melania Trump, be best. Nancy Reagan, just say no. Uh, breast cancer addiction with Betty Ford. You know, they've, they've all had them. And it's because of women like Lucy Hayes that came before him. And there's that last picture that I wanted to show. It's so important. This is the last known picture or one of the last known pictures of Lucy Hayes. She's wearing Rutherford's hat, sitting on a porch right outside of her bedroom window where she had little roosts uh, drilled into those steps for the pigeons and feeding it. And you can see the woman, I I mean, from, from 16 to, I believe she was 58-ish when she died, um, uh, in, in her late 50s anyway, um, you know, just just this comfortable woman, and she, man, did she love animals. She did. If, if you went to Spiegel Grove to visit with her, she'd take you out into the chicken coop, walk through the cow fields. It's said, I think this might be a, a bit of a romanticism of history, but during her funeral, as her caisson went rolling past the cow pasture, they said all the cows watched her go by. And she had goats, chickens, dogs, um, just, uh, just a, a, a wonderfully kind um, uh, human being. Uh, see, there's, there's some young pictures. Hair a little bit different there, but not too terribly much with young Rutherford before his beard. I noticed this morning when I was getting ready, I'm looking a bit Rutherford myself during my, during my COVID winter growth. So what a, what a perfect time to be talking about Rutherford and, uh, and, and, and Lucy. There's one of the events that I was talking about at Spiegel Grove, um, which I think is fantastic. You can really see, um, you, you know, the, 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 the house there done up for the visitors, done up for the, for the veterans or whoever might be appearing there uh, on the guest list, but a beautiful front lawn there where they would have these people over for these, these events that I know everyone enjoyed and loved. And you look at the pictures and you can see everyone having such a good time. Um, Lucy was a mother. We talked about this a little bit. Um, they had eight children, uh, uh, Rutherford and Lucy. Five of them lived to be adults. Um, the the last uh, the last child sadly uh, died. Uh, one of one of the one of the tragedies that didn't make it to adulthood um, uh, at 18 months, uh, a severe case of dysentery. Um, but there she is in the conservatory at the White House with some of her children that she did love so very much. Um, there's an older picture. Um, interesting that they're playing tennis. Uh, or tennis rackets was an activity that the children and the grandchildren, numerous grandchildren. There's a lot of hazes running around. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, I'm, I worked with a woman who went to kindergarten uh, with, with a Rutherford haze, and they keep a lot of that Rutherford name goes along. So there's still a, a, a number of ancestors uh, still around with the hazes having, having, again, five children that would live to adulthood, and they would have children and children and children. Um, um, but, but, um, the Hayes's loved their Spiegel Grove 
And the bedroom there at Spiegel Grove, the master bedroom was on the first floor. Interestingly enough, all the children had uh, rooms throughout the house and, and upstairs. And um, Lucy writes in di diaries and journals about um, loving this room and loving her children and loving their family so much and enjoying Christmas in the bedroom. They would all come in on their parents' beds. And, and this is a part of my journey and a part of my research and a part of what I talk about and a part of the series where these women revealed themselves to me as real people. And I think that's a very, very interesting thing to, to, to uh, uh, recognize. I want to I want to read one more um, passage from the Lucy Hayes. This is how I start out each chapter in the book, and it's based on the fact that these are real people. And I wanted to start every chapter the same way, by noting their realness, by by putting something together like this. Lucy Hayes was born Lucy Ware Webb on August twenty eighth, eighteen thirty one, in Chillicothe, Ohio. Her parents were Dr. James Webb and Maria Cook Webb. Lucy and Rutherford B. Hayes were married on December 30th, 1852. Lucy and Rutherford had eight children together. Lucy Hayes died on June 25th, 1889 in Fremont, Ohio at the age of 58. It's some simple information, but it just shows. These people have parents. They have children. They have brothers. They have sisters. They win. They lose. They live. They die. They're real. And I always like to give that sort of perspective and that angle and that viewpoint because it's a perspective we can take on into modern times. It's a perspective we can take when we look at other first ladies and maybe judge them a little differently or a little less harshly than is popular or, or common, more common today where there's more criticism than praise or, or looking for things to poke at where, you know, again, unpaid, unelected. And for the most part, these women are taking their position and taking their role and trying to make the world a better place. Um, back to the bedroom, of course, there was a sewing machine in there. She also had a, um, a an ad it was a, a food ad, a baby food ad, a grocery store baby food ad with a little cherub-like baby that reminded her of the um, of one of her grandchildren. So family, very, very important. And seeing these personal places and seeing these personal rooms, you get such a great perspective of your life. You see a sewing machine in the corner. You see photographs. And I tell you, Spiegel Grove is one of those great places where you walk in the door and it looks like the hazes are just stepped out for a walk and they're coming back. You know, there's two kinds of, 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 of uh, museums or historical sites. There's the kind that is all exhibit driven and you see cases and, and, and notes and cards, you know, like you would see in a typical museum or something that you'd see in the Smithsonian. And then there's the place that literally looks like the folks are going to walk in the door any moment. Now, the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center has both. They've got a presidential library and museum on the grounds, and they've got this home that, again, with all of the, the, the furniture. And, you, and, you know, looking in the bedroom, you can see a almost a turquoise blue couch, and you see paintings from the White House of this turquoise blue. So now, you know, it might not have been Lucy's favorite color, but, you know, it was one of her favorite colors. Um, Dolly Madison liked red. Elizabeth Monroe liked blue, a purer blue. But this is, um, you know, they had a piece, uh, it's, it's almost like a, a day bed or a sitting couch that was at the end of the bed in the Hayes' um, master bedroom. And when they, when they took it apart to, to rehab it, to refurbish it, they could see the original color of the fabric, almost a turquoise velvet fabric, and then match that to other paintings that had been done of rooms while they were in the White House. And you can only assume that it was one of the, one of the favorite colors of Lucy. But this room is very, very important for a number of reasons. Number one, it's very personal. It's where they stayed. It's where they lived. Um, it's where they celebrated Christmas. It's where they opened up their gifts. It's also where that youngest child I mentioned, uh, the one who died, uh, the, 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 the last of their children to be born at 18 months, it's where he was born. That child was born in that room. There's a lot of things that happen in these houses, very, very personal things, things that are written about in journals and diaries to learn about these people and see these things. So it's a room of joy where they celebrated holidays and Christmas and family time together. There's also journals about having big family breakfasts in bed and things like that in the, in the, in the master bedroom there at uh, Spiegel Grove. But it's also where Lucy died. She was sitting in her favorite chair at the window 
watching uh, some of her children or grandchildren play tennis. That's why I mentioned the, the tennis rackets in this, um, in this photograph. And she had a stroke at uh, 58 years old. And it was written that she just kind of slumped over in the chair. And then she was transferred over to the bed. And it's the actual bed. So it affects you. It, it, it's, it's so human to look and stand in a room where you imagine a family as I've done myself. I can remember opening up my Christmas stockings on my parents' bed and running in to wake them up on Christmas morning. But it's also where one of their children was born and, and tragically died early. And it's also where, where Lucy would die. So you have to sit in a room like that as you're, as you're filming for a television series or interviewing, you're getting the information and doing the research. And you really have to take all that in and, and realize the importance and the heaviness of it. And that's, again, another reason why I, I go uh, uh, if they are uh, in, entombed, buried, uh, memorialized there on the property, just to kind of, you know, out of respect to, to just say thank you for, for what you've done, the role you played, but also opening this life up. You know, I mean, I, I don't I don't know that I'd be as, as willing to open up my entire life with my diaries, my journals, and my, my private space, my belongings to have people, um, you know, go through. Not that they've really given their permission, but it's part of, it's what we've done as a country, as citizens, um, you know, to 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 learn and 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 um, and and promote this this kind of of history, which is something I, I, I think that we should uh, uh uh, take into account, and also for for a woman that I did find so caring and um, and and so important to the role of first ladies, it was nice to have all of that place as it should have been, as she would have had it to see it to get to know her better. Um, there's some more uh, family pictures uh, from the uh, from the front porch there at Spiegel Grove, which I think is fantastic. Again, uh, Lucy, just you know the the hairstyle and the clothes, it's just so so comfortable and 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 unchanged and 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 happy, uh, seemingly happy. There's uh, evidence of of her love for animals again, um, not pigeons this time, but one of their dogs that ran around a uh, uh, Spiegel Grove there. And um, I want to talk about her china collection because this word, you know, I, I, she loved the she loved the um, the the outdoors, the, the 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 animals and the things, and she got a lot of grief for this. And this is one thing that pops up uh, with uh, in conversations with with Lucy Hayes. Um, she celebrated the the man who designed it was uh, Theodore Davis, and she had him over to the White House in the conservatory. And she wanted to she wanted visiting people from foreign countries to know what kind of plants and animals we had here. But um, this was a step out, which I also have to respect. Uh, I, I like to think of myself as an individual. I like to think of myself as marching to the beat of my own drum. And you know, all of the White House china. Um, the first set of White House China was the Monroe set. Uh, prior to that, people would bring their own um, uh, um, favorite sets of China from, from their homes and take it home with them. Then the Monroes designed the first official set of White House China. So, um, and, and on through now and today, and some people share and go back and forth and use other people's China. We have a wonderful China collection in part because of Caroline Harrison, First Lady Caroline Harrison put um, that together for us in the, in the very end of the 1800s. So we would have that history. But here's, here's Lucy Hayes going out and there's not eagles and crests and and uh, uh, red, white, and blue, and 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 all of the stuff that you expect to see, and there's the, the gold filigree and things like that. But the oyster plates, and the, you know, someone had written that that they are as they were finishing their dessert, they saw a lobster jump off the plate at them that was riding a wave. And you know, some of it is is a little wild and a little out there, but just something that's different. And again, you know, I mean, even beyond the the the, the criticism and people saying, you know, what's going on with this china? She used it, and she used it proudly, and um, at at Spiegel Grove, again, they've got this beautiful, wonderful uh, sideboard that's right out of the White House. And there's a picture right next to the, the sideboard that shows it in use in the White House, which I think is absolutely fantastic because then you see the china, you see the sideboard, then you see it used in the White House, and it really gives you a perspective. It takes you back in time because you've got all the puzzle pieces. You know, you 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 see it. It's 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 uh, fantastic. Uh, there's the sideboard. There, look at that. I even got that up there for you. That's uh, from the Hayes Presidential Center. You see the the watermark there, but a beautiful piece of furniture with the uh, with the china uh, uh, proudly displayed there. Uh, I, you know, 
Lucy Hayes gave me another opportunity, which I thought was fantastic. This is her birth home in Chillicothe, Ohio. Um, it's recently gone under um, a bunch of renovations. It's a beautiful, beautiful facility. I, I believe Chillicothe used to be the, um, the capital of Ohio. In any event, this is where Lucy Webb was born, in the house with her brothers and sisters. And it's a wonderful, it's kind of a mix. You know, they've, they've got a lot of displays and a lot of cabinets. And I know the Ross County Historical Association there, where I had the uh, opportunity of speaking. I also, in this house, this very house, I got to speak to, I think, four, maybe five different um, junior high, middle school, eighth grade history classes uh, that, that came through with a, with a really just fantastic uh, forward thinking teacher of taking kids out and giving them this experience and preserving the history. Um, this is a location that I didn't get to get to during the, um, the, the C-SPAN White House Historical Association uh, series. There's only so much time, you know, and we were on a, we were on a breakneck schedule with that. You know, I was uh, just to give you perspective, I was just finishing up my work in Plains, Georgia for Rosalind Carter. And I was watching the Nixon's show live there really wasn't wiggle room. And back in 20, I guess it would have been 2013, um, uh, uh, the government had shut down uh, during the Obama administration, a big, you know, uh, it, it happens. Uh, um, con congressional uh, grandstanding and budget work and, you know, well, we'll you know, shut things down. But it shut down for over a month while we were trying to produce this series. So when the government is shut down, you can't go to national historic sites and you can't go to um, the... Uh, 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 Archives and Records Administration, which run the presidential libraries, uh, Hoover through uh, Bush 43. So, and that's right where we were in the in the production of things. So things came to a grinding halt after the breakneck speed, but then we had to play catch up. And there wasn't always time or money in the budget to get to every single place, but this is still an important place in Lucy Hayes's life. And it's a place where I'm very, very happy that I got to go and put this piece of the puzzle in for a first lady that I adored so much to see where she was born, see some of the original um, uh, furniture, baby cradles, uh, beds that are in this house that were used by the Webb family um, and all decorated beautifully uh, to the time, uh, in addition to the to the actual to the actual artifacts. Um, you know, it, it's it's. Um, this is also a first lady that that I, I really got to, especially after going to Chillicothe, trace her entire life. You get to see where a woman was born. You get to see some of the furniture that was used when she was a child, used by her family. You see uh, uh, the progression through Spiegel Grove of uh, Rutherford and Lucy's life. You see college uh, and education, a formal training, some of the essays that she would have written and, and see where that caringness comes from, see where her nature and character are, are, are born and, and, and fostered through that education and through her writings. And you get to see where her children were born and where they celebrated things, where she kept her animals, and then eventually uh, where she died. So um, I really feel like I have a complete story on, on Lucy, uh, having physically been there, seen things. Again, you know, you go to these museums and like they have at Spiegel Grove where you see the White House China, which is always a topic of conversation with Lucy and you see it in an actual sideboard. Then you see that sideboard in use in the White House and you, you almost feel like you were there, that it is um, such a complete story. I wanna watch my time here and I wanna be mindful. I know that we, um, uh, typically I go long uh, the past um, few times I've gone long and there hasn't been time for questions. So I do want to leave time for questions as there typically is a lot of them, are a lot of them. I want to just go look through my notes here real quickly to see if I, if I missed anything um, that I wanted to talk about. And I'm, I'm pretty clear on that. So um, Robert, if you'd like to open the floor up for questions at this point. Um, oh yeah, sure thing. And, but you can, Andrew, you can talk for as long as you want. <laughs> sure, no, no, no. And, and I mean, I, I, I could go on and I, you know, the interesting thing about this is that, you know, the, um, um, one of the folks at the White House Historical Association had asked me after the series, you know, what, what, is, what, what truly amazed you? What's one thing? I said, what truly amazes me is how much more material there is. You know, the, each of the shows were 90 minutes and we had experts and authors and fantastic people on. Then we had my pieces that I would do outside to take the viewer outside of the of the series, outside of Washington, D.C., into these people's lives, into these women's lives, into these families' lives. 
And, and for as much as, you know, I might do a 45 minute interview with someone uh, in Elizabeth Monroe's kitchen about her as a hostess in the, in the 17 and 1800s and five minutes of that interview, three minutes of that interview uh, might make it into the show because we take calls from viewers and things like that. So, you know, when I first wanted to do this, I, I wanted to tell everything that was out there and I can't do that in a speech. I can't do that here today. Um, then I decided to put it in the book, you know, with my notes from the series and the travels and everything. And, and, and then there's more places to get to, like following up and going to Chillicothe. I've also been to Dolly Madison's birthplace outside of Greensboro, North Carolina. So there's so much more to add to this story and uh, for all of these women. And then each four to eight years, we're adding a new first lady. But my overarching theme for this, if I can leave you all with something before we get to the questions, is that women have been part of our leadership, part of the formation, and part of the intelligence pool and thinking of America from the very beginning, from the Revolutionary War. It's not a matter of inviting them into the room or, 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 or having them as part of the conversation. They've been a part of it. We just need to recognize that. And if you exclude that from the conversation, and from the thinking and the development, then you're taking out half of half of your, your intelligence. You're taking out half of your resources. Um, and these women have all been such an instrumental piece of their husband's success and putting their lives on hold to push their husband forward and get their husbands into office and be part of the campaigns and be part of women's suffrage and, 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 and issues to get them voting and to be part of this conversation historically. Um, not to mention the philanthropies that I went over. So, you know, one, the, the title of the book, uh, Unusual for Their Time, comes from going to each of these locations and having, literally, I thought it was like in the National Park Service or Rangers Handbook or the, the, the docent's guide for uh, American history to say that these people were unusual for their time. And I'm thinking, well, they can't all be unusual for their time. That's a, that's a line that's coming, you know, everyone's unusual for their time. If you've got everyone unusual, but then the unusual becomes usual. But then I thought about it more and, and, and that's, you know, I say that half in tongue in cheek, but each of these women are unusual for the time. Statistically speaking, no one on this call today is going to be first lady and no one ever runs for first lady. No one has ever elected first lady. No one has ever paid first lady. Yet we judge them as though they are. And this historical relevance and perspective that we can put and learn from each of these first ladies as we go on to the next one about that kindness, about that philanthropy, about making the world and leaving the world a better place than you found it is really embraced in, in every first lady and, and the work that they've done or every official hostess or family member that stood in in place of a first lady that hasn't. And you know when you think of it in terms of that, then again, you judge these women a little differently or maybe don't judge them at all and understand what the work they do and where the work they do comes from. And um, these women have been part of the formation of the modern world in more than a significant way. They're probably the most influential and powerful unelected and unpaid women in the world. And Lucy Hayes was one of the original path trailblazers in that philanthropic work. And, um, and she did it uh, very, very humbly, very effectively, and in a way that, that endeared herself to me. I thank you all for your time. Let's see if we got some other pictures here that I missed. There's a nice one of, of Rutherford and Lucy sitting together in, in Spiegel Grove. Uh, I'm looking at it right, right next to me as I lean up to the screen and look at it, looking at my beard and my hair pushed back. Um, Lucy had fantastic gowns too at the at Spiegel Grove. They've got a number. She made her wedding dress, by the way. Uh, that's that's the kind of seamstress she was. She made the dress that she was uh, married in. Oh, there's a sneak peek. Okay, well, someone's going to ask, and maybe 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 they will. And this will be a this will be a nice little little shout out as we as we finish up. People will always ask, you know, have you met any first ladies? And I've I've met a bunch. I've met, I've met a bunch. They've all been fantastic. Uh, Laura Bush, Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is the first first lady I met, and it's Betty Ford. And I met her on the mall in Washington, D.C. I live just outside of Washington, D.C. I was born in Rockville, Maryland, went to the University of Maryland. Um, and my family and I would go down to the mall on a regular basis. Uh, 1976 was a big year for Washington, D.C., a big year for the Fords, a big year for the country, our bicentennial. And, um, and when we popped out of this car, 
or, or, or we, we were down on the mall and, and a woman hopped out of the car right in the middle of everything. And one of my parents, my mother and my father said, well, that's, that's the president's wife. That's for, so I ran over with my little Kodak 110 camera, snapped a shot there, uh, held up over the, the park ranger's uh, shoulder. That, that, that photo always gets a, a cheer when I speak at national parks and, uh, and historical sites uh, as, as it should. And, and luckily, because it was filmed back then, you didn't know if you got the shot. Luckily, the film came out and uh, I know it's April 14th, 1976, because uh, my, my wonderful late mother's handwriting is on the back of the photograph. Um, it was in a scrapbook that she put together for me, a photo album that she put together for me throughout my life. Um, sadly, my, my mother wasn't around to see uh, these books or this uh, television series, but she would have loved it. And I always, I always mention that and I always dedicate it to her memory because she was a, a wonderful lady who taught me a great respect for women uh, and 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 mothers and moms, just just great things. And and then she said, you know, go stand over by the by the the first lady's car. So so there's there's your first lady's man in in 1976 with his Sears tough skins size, probably three four sizes too big. So it probably would have lasted me all the way up to uh, uh, fifth or sixth grade in front of Betty Ford, first lady Betty Ford's car there. And um, I'll, I'll leave my remarks there with a little chuckle and, and just let you all know that that firstladiesman.com is where you can find me. It is where you can find the books. I'd love to sign set, uh, sign copies of them for you and uh, get you more of the, the, the bigger picture there. There's video, there's interviews, there's social media, everything else where, you, where you'd like to connect. And uh, as always, to be continued, the, the, the story goes on. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that, Andrew. So last time we... I posted the link for the um, the videos that you were talking about, the documentaries in the comments, and we kept talking about it. But no matter how many times, I think we did it like 10 times, there were still people saying, hey, can I get that one more time? So I'll just email it out um, <laughs> and along with some other stuff that Andrew and I have. So we'll email you some stuff um, either later today or tomorrow that has kind of like a recap of some of the things we've talked about and uh, Andrew's website and the um, series that he was working on just FYI so we did get quite a few you can't questions. Robert you can't I'll just throw in you you can you can view the series I put the series the C-SPAN series is on my website so you can go to firstladiesman.com and just click the video page and it takes you directly to the C-SPAN series and you can watch it and there's tons uh, of them order the show or out of order and, and there's lots of video extras in there it's it's just, yeah, people seem to remember firstladiesman.com easier than c-span.org slash firstladies and all this. So I just, I try and make it easy for everyone because, you know, we, I just want people to see the series because I was, you know, that's the other thing. I, I These women made me the first ladies man. I, I didn't consciously think I'm going to go into this and then I'm going to write a book and then I'm going to do speeches and I'm going to remember this stuff forever. And I, I like th their stories were so impressive that it's ingrained in my, in my, in my brain. I, I like, you know, I've, uh, it's just re remarkable what a huge role they played in America, leadership, and the modern world that I had no choice but to keep talking about this and get the message out. So that's the important part. I'd, I'd love for, for anyone and everyone interested to, to watch the series. Um, uh, I, I played a, a role in that with so many other people's hard work and, and research and, and commentary and information that went into it. It's just a, a, a wonderful resource. It's, it's, it's the largest resource of, of video interviews, information that exists on all of these first ladies in the world. Um, and and it, it's, it's every single one. So uh, again, with that, your, your, your questions, sure. Sure. Um, so I did have to step away for a couple of minutes and this question came up earlier. So I don't know if you talked about this. Someone asked, do you happen to have any idea how um, Rutherford and Lucy met? Mm. So I don't know if you talked about that because I did, I apologize, I had to step I, away. I, you know, I, I didn't. And I know that they, that they um, dated from a very young age um, and, and that I, I believe they were, they were family friends in Ohio. I mean, you got to think like people were, were, were not terribly spread out. You know, Ohio was thought of as the wild west at that point, everything, anything on, on, um, you know, that, that part. Well, gosh, I mean, people thought Pennsylvania was, was, uh, uh, pretty wild, uh, when uh, James Buchanan was, was coming up. So they, they were both from Ohio and um, I, I don't know specifically where, where they met. Uh, it's definitely something, something to look into that wasn't, uh, okay. that, that doesn't stick out. Yeah, me. no problem. It's probably just met in different social circles. And what about, do you happen to know if they were very religious, someone asked? 
Oh, well, I did. Yeah, well, um, uh, another question from earlier. Lucy was for sure. That's where she took the temperance role and wrote um, very often about religious uh, uh, issues uh, of the of the day uh, when she was in college. So yes, a Protestant they they were. Okay, and then this is an um, interesting question. So Tina writes: there are before and after pictures online of the presidents, which shows a president changed how how being president changed them. So like Abraham Lincoln comes. To oh mind. yeah. You know of any such comparison for first ladies or well, uh, not across the board? I mean, you, you can definitely Google if you go back to the pictures. I've got the the one picture of Lucy Hayes when she was uh, 16, where she looks pretty much the same throughout her life. And then some of those later pictures where she's sitting on the porch, um, you can you can tell that she's older, but 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 not very not very much, you know, it didn't, but I, but I know what you mean with the presidents where their hairs get, their hair gets gray. My God, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln before and after the civil war, the civil war aged him 40 years. I mean, that guy, that that's, that's one of the most dramatic, but in modern times you see like president Obama went gray. Uh, um, uh, Bill Clinton was kind of grayish when he went in and gray -er when he went out, uh, George W. Bush, uh, 100%. I think they also say with the president that their signatures sometimes get smaller as people just berate them and berate them and berate them and they lose confidence to a certain extent, even if subconsciously. But um, uh, there's nothing formal like that for first ladies, but you can find most of the pictures of these women as young women or prior to that as paintings and then see what their what their official White House portraits look like to get that comparison. And so we always attract a well-read, well-traveled group of individuals on these programs. And so Lisa and Terry chimed in and said that they believe that uh, the Hayes, the two of them, uh, Lucy and Rutherford, met at Ohio Wesleyan University. So they met at school. So that, that sounds very, 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 very familiar. I think that that some of uh, uh, Lucy's brothers were attending school there. Um, and, and an interesting story that's relatable, not not. Uh, the the grants um, um, I, and thank you for that. I, then now that you jog my memory, that that one hundred percent sounds sounds accurate. Um, um, Julia Dent, uh, who would become Julia Grant, she met um, Ulysses S. Grant through her brother. They were at West Point together, and um, her brother actually um, uh, her brother. Uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant saved her brother's life in, in battle. I'm not sure which war, maybe it was the, the Mexican-American war. Um, but but uh, so when he came home for like a holiday visit, so, so the Dent family could thank Ulysses S. Grant for saving this man's life, he fell in love with Julia Grant. And even though there were, there were big differences between like uh, slave ownership and North and South, uh, Ulysses being from the North and the Dents being from just, just, just on the cusp of the South, but but having uh, slaves and things like that, they they were not uh, um, uh, in agreement on a lot of things. In fact, uh, Grant's parents didn't even come to the wedding because they wouldn't go to the wedding of a of a family that, that owned slaves. But but they but they they fell in uh, uh, Ulysses and Julia fell in love there around the family uh, dinner table outside of St. Louis because of of knowing uh, Julia's brother in in college. So yeah, that that that's that's one hundred percent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, whoever chimed in with that. Oh, no problem. And then I was just going to mention, so originally I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and not too far away is the Spiegel Grove that you were talking about. And I've been there, um, I think, at least twice, maybe three times and really recommend it. So if you want to know where it is, here's the map. So it's kind of in between Toledo and Cleveland, Ohio. And you can go to one of my favorite places, uh, uh, Cedar Point, and ride the roller coasters. Oh, yeah, you know, Cedar Point. <laughs> see, but also at, at, the, at, the, at Spiegel Grove, they do an amazing they really, really do a lot of events and the places that do these things to, to really get people out there to, to attract them and promote the, uh, the history. They do a, 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 a set, a sit down served Christmas dinner, a period dinner that would have been like a dinner in the 1800s when the Hayes's uh, were alive and living there. They, they just do so many wonderful, neat events. And again, I can't say enough about Tom Culbertson, the former director and the current director, uh, Christy Weininger, who's a good friend. We had so much fun filming there. They, they really just made it a good time. And everyone that works over in the museum and library have just always been fantastic to me. So I just really, really can't thank folks like that enough. 
Yeah, and so you can see this is the TripAdvisor screenshot. And TripAdvisor, if you're not familiar with it, I talk about this site a lot because it's really cool. People go out there and rate um, different tourist attractions, kind of like how people rate restaurants on Yelp. And um, I don't do the ratings myself. I just actually like to look at them to see what people think. And you can see from TripAdvisor, 349 people, they've really rated this a very highly uh, historic site. And I think because, Andrew, you were talking about it has had kind of a you know, it looks like they were just stepped out for a minute. Like it really does. And, and I, I came into so many, the, the Harding home is like that in Marion, Ohio too. And they do such a great job there. Um, uh, I mean, that, it looked like my grandparents' house. I'm not even kidding you. Um, they, they had clothes hanging in the closet, clothes in dressers. James Buchanan's wheat field is, is like 75% original. You know, when I was in there filming, I went to, to walk over and adjust some lighting. And uh, um, the, the director there, a, a young woman, I, I forget, wonderful, wonderful resource and, and so accommodating. Um, I, I walked over to the to the Venetian blinds the, 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 and I said, oh, can I just adjust this, you know, to get, get a little less light in there? She goes, yeah, but just be very, very careful. Those are old. I said, well, what do you mean old? Like originally said, yeah, I go, okay, I'm not, I'm not touching them. You know, I, I was, I was raised going through the Smithsonian and things like that, where you, you walk in with your hands in your pockets or, or behind your back. So you don't knock anything over or wreck anything. And I, just to see these places with their music, but Harriet Lane, uh, uh, James Buchanan's niece and official white house hostess says James Buchanan, the only uh, bachelor president never to marry uh, number 15, right before uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. So Harriet Lane's piano is in the parlor with Harriet Lane's music book sitting on the piano, <laughs> ready to open up and sit down and play. And she would entertain with patriotic and, and religious hymns when when uh, her uncle would be entertaining and sit at the piano. I, it just, it just it, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's also amazing how the stuff that we've lost and that we don't have and things like that. But it's, it's such a, a, a such, such, Remarkable resources these uh, these locations, especially the older ones that are that are privately run by foundations and things like that that don't have federal funding behind them, like a Spiegel Grove or a Wheatland for uh, James Buchanan. Yeah, there's several of the, there's several presidential related sites in Ohio because so many presidents um, either were, were from Ohio or had some kind of connection. And um, I yeah, oh, Ohio, big... Ohio, Virginia, and New York are the top three. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm a big history nerd. And so um, living in Washington, D.C. and going back home to Detroit, where my family is, uh, I usually drive just because you can stop and see all these interesting things that you wouldn't get a chance to if you were just flying from airport to airport. So that's really cool. Um, someone asked, this is a little bit off topic. Do you know if Abraham and Mary Lincoln um, drank alcohol? You were talking before about the I don't know that myself, but I don't know. I don't drink myself. So I don't. I don't, I'll tell you this. I don't know that they shows. didn't, um, you know, and, and even, even in like the Polk white house and the, 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 the uh, Cleveland white house where the first ladies were part of the temperance move, movement as well. Um, there typically wine was served. Uh, not that wine is not considered alcohol, but when we talk about um, Lucy Hayes with the temperance movement, it's, it's just the, the, the hard rum and, and, and whiskey punches and, and the bourbons and, and things like that, uh, that, that wine was, was typically served as, as, as you know, socially a, appropriate. And, um, but I, I, I've never heard of the Lincolns not, I know that, I know that Mary, uh, well, m you know, we all, we all know Mary had some, some issues um, um, and, and in self-medicating and things like that. I don't know that alcohol was ever um, part of that self-medication. I have not heard that it was, or that either of them uh, uh, drank not not to excess or, or or at all yeah i've read a lot about both the lincolns and um i don't even recall ever hearing yeah i don't recall it being mentioned that. but but there but there i'll tell you when you hear more about it when when they don't you know because it's more of a more of a uh a, a, an oddity or, or more yeah of you hear you hear about it if it's one extreme or the other like if someone exactly, has a drinking exactly, problem you exactly. hear about it or if they don't drink at all you hear about that and then yeah i mean we know franklin pierce had some issues but they lost all their children that's just such a tragic story we should do robert we should do one on jane pierce that would be a that would be that would be one that most people do not know uh much if anything about it a, a jane pierce from it's a, just a fascinating story. It's a tragic story, but but just yeah, fascinating. that would be great. Someone typed in the comments. The only thing that they knew about Lucy Hayes before this program was that her nickname was Lemonade Lucy. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's funny. I, and and um, I, I had a traffic ticket, a speeding ticket um, a few years ago, and I went into court and the, the judge was asking everyone what they did. 
where do you go to school? What do you do for a living? Do you like that? All this kind of stuff. I'm thinking like, wow, this guy's really taking an interest in whatever. It's just like, you know, I was like 10 miles over the speed limit, cruising out of town, not paying attention. And so he came up and he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm an author and a historian on uh, U.S. First Ladies. He said, really? And then his first question was, who's your favorite First Lady? <laughs> Which I get all the time. I said, well, sir, your honor. Uh, and I gave the answer that I always do. I said, I, I can't pick just one. I, I love them all. That's why I do what I do. And I said, but I'll tell you, I'd like, you know, Abigail Adams for the 1700s, uh, Lucy Hayes for the 1800s. And he goes, Lemonade Lucy, huh? And I know that it's Spiegel Grove and, and all the folks out there, you know, they, they, there's so much more to her than that. And that's why I always try and explain that, like, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, she still threw amazing parties. She, by all accounts, was an amazing hostess and she didn't side with one or the other. It was just a personal choice for her. Um, so, you know, to, to, to thank you for that comment. Um, you know, a lot of times people don't even know that. They don't even know that, that her name is Lucy Hayes. They couldn't name Rutherford B. Hayes. I, you know, before the project, I don't know that I could have said Lucy Hayes definitively was Rutherford B. Hayes's uh, uh, wife, although Lucy, a, a bit of an unusual name as far as first ladies go. But, um, you know, that, that's what I like to do with this, this project so much. You know, everyone does know about Jacqueline Kennedy and she's important. And everyone does know about Betty Ford. She's important. And all the modern ones and Eleanor Roosevelt and this, but you know, the, the, and Abigail Adams, who we did talk about, but then for every one of those, there's a Lucy Hayes or an Ida McKinley or a Helen Taft or an Edith Roosevelt. You know, there's two Roosevelt women and they've all got something to contribute and they've all got part of the story. So thank you very much. Whoever, whoever uh, 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 made that comment. Okay, no problem. And then we're honored to have Craig Howell joining us um, in the audience today. Craig's a historian and tour guide in Washington, D.C., and a member of the Lincoln Group of Washington, D.C. And he says that Abraham Lincoln did not drink alcohol, but he's not sure about Mary. So thank you, Craig, for that. Greatly appreciate that. Um, and another person asked, this is kind of more of a broader question, but what about like, what would be the the day-to-day -day activities of the first ladies back around the time of Lucy Hayes? Um, you know, now the first lady thought this person was saying is that you know um more modern ones it's like a full-time job like they're sure, probably doing sure. first lady stuff like all day long was it that way for the first ladies of the 1800s or did they have more free time no you know what that's a, that's, a, buried? that's a great question and no one's ever asked me that question before it was kind of like basically like what would be like a typical day for a first lady um, yeah 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 so in the 1800s this, this kind of even goes back to the 1700s. These women, these hostesses, these wives, they were running corporations. They were running the, the farms, the plantations, the staffs, um, uh, sadly, uh, in some instances, many instances, the slaves. Um, you know, they were in charge of the house and the house was more than a house. The house was making the food, making the drink, making the cotton that would that make the clothes. Uh, that's why I say that, you know, uh, Martha Washington was the CEO of a corporation. They owned real estate. They had tenant farmers. Um, they had large families because there were so many people dying. It was, it was a numbers game at that point. You know, you had so many kids because you didn't think all of them were going to necessarily make it. I mean, you think about the Washingtons, Martha and George Washington didn't have any children of their own. The children that you see in paintings and portraits and etchings and stuff of the, the Washingtons are, are Martha's grandchildren from the children of her first marriage. George and Martha had no children. But, but like, like I say, during the Revolutionary War and during the Civil War, what these women did was they organized religious ceremonies, theatrical performances, dinners. You know, there weren't, mail was not great. Uh, there were not trains. Uh, well, I guess in the Civil War there were trains and things, but but before you know railway and 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 ship things were shipped by horse-drawn carriage and things like that. No electricity, no phones, no. These these dinners, these afternoon teas, these religious ceremonies, these, things, these were massive politicking, networking, decision-making uh, 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 events and and social gatherings. They, they, had, they had such an incredible importance and the first lady would have to figure out how much food to get, how many eggs, how much butter, you know, was salads, desserts. Um, and we didn't have electricity to keep that all, uh, 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 you know, fresh and, and, and warm. You had to have it packed under, under ice in, in ice houses and things like that. It just, life was so much more difficult back then 
And, and these women had to basically organize and run the lives of these massive corporations that would then become, you know, the, 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 the White House. That's cool. Thank you very much. And let's see if we take any other questions. I've got you quiet all of a sudden, Robert. Are you muted? Oh, sorry. I'm, oh. I have two computers. <laughs> there you go. I, um, I'm watching you on one computer and, and doing um, like the Zoom stuff on the other. Um, computer. What about someone asked, was there any particular object at the Spiegel Grove of Lucy Hayes that you thought was interesting, like a, you know, a personal oh, item of hers? Great question. The, the, the Hayeses um, were one of a few presidential couples, uh, first families, to celebrate their uh, 25th wedding anniversary in the, um, in the White House. And something that I thought was, was really, really touching was a, um, a cameo brooch that uh, Mrs. Hayes had made for her or was a gift to her uh, to commemorate their 25th anniversary. And it was the, it was the silhouettes of, of her in Rutherford. Um, you know, by, 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 all, uh, by all counts and writings and things that I saw, um, you know, they, they were a true love match and they, they had a big, wonderful uh, family together and a, and a beautiful home and life together there at Spiegel Grove. And to see them celebrate that love 25 years in their silver anniversary, there at the White House, um, uh, I thought that was very special. What a great question. Thank you. And then let's see, so a few people asked if this was being recorded and yes, it is. So um, we do record some of our programs. We're not able to record all of them for different technical reasons, but um, you can find them, and I'll, again, I'll email this link as well later. It's Washington DC History and Culture. You can find us on YouTube. We have all kinds of, I think we have like over 30 of these programs. Um, on there, so you can check that out. And previously, if you work with us earlier, Andrew did initially in January, kind of like an overview of the role of the first ladies from Martha Washington all the way up to Dr. Jill Biden. Um, and then in February, he did Abigail Adams last month. And then of course this month today was Lucy Hayes and he's gonna come back next month and we're working out the details. It's gonna be on a Friday night. I think it's um, Friday, April 9th at eight o'clock and I'll send out the invitation. So he's gonna do a similar presentation, but about Lou Hoover from Iowa for all of our friends there. And then quite a few people were chiming in. That they've been to Spiegel Grove and they really recommend it a lot. So that was excellent. Fantastic. You. you know, Rob, I've got so many people that follow me on uh, Facebook and, and social media that are from Ohio and love whenever I put the Ohio first ladies up there in my daily facts or, or speak about them. And I know um, uh, um, a friend of mine there on social media was going to, was going to send it to all of her friends in and around Spiegel Grove and Fremont, Ohio. So it's, it's wonderful to have everyone out there uh, uh, tuning in. Today. What about just a sneak preview? What's maybe one or two interesting things about Lou Hoover that people can look forward to learning? Uh, Lou, <laughs> Lou Hoover, Lou Hoover is one of my favorites across the board. Lou and and Herbert Hoover are are probably two of the most capable people that ever lived in the White House. Um, uh, they were just there at the wrong time. They could not have predicted or caused or even solved the Great Depression in in um, in four years. Or you know, it's just that economics are are a that are a strange animal, but what they did in their uh, prior to the White House, their philanthropic endeavors. Lou Hoover's basically self-taught seven different languages, more than any first lady in history, including the only first lady to speak Mandarin uh, Chinese. Um, um, and and Lou and Herbert Hoover, I do know how they met. They met they met at Stanford University in geology class. Uh, she's um, uh, uh, the, the first female, the first woman to graduate with a geology degree from Stanford and in all likelihood the, the entire United States. And they traveled around the world and became self-made millionaires in the uh, rare stones and gems industry um, uh, in their, in their 30s. It completely, neither of them came from money and, and they were, they were self-made people in, in uh, rare, rare precious metals, gemology uh, from their geology degrees in Stanford where they met just a, a true force, uh, their, their partnership and, and a, a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful woman to uh, speak with. I would have liked to have hung out with Lou. She was, she, she was a, she was a good time. She, she liked horseback riding and, and, uh, uh archery. And, and she had a couple, a uh, few different collections from her travels around the world. Just a remarkable, remarkable woman. 
the other house uh, in Ohio is open to the public, so it's a great place to visit. And for myself, one of the things I thought was interesting about her is uh, I really love Eleanor Roosevelt, like many people do. But a lot of the things that Eleanor Roosevelt gets credit for doing, actually Lou Hoover did before her. And <laughs> Eleanor just kind of overshadowed her so much. So a lot of kind of, you know, the modern first lady really kind of starting around that time with Lou Hoover and Grace Coolidge and Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, well, and again, you know, I mean, like the, these women are so tied to their husbands in so many instances. And and if something like the Great Depression happens in your, you look at Pat Nixon and Watergate, you know, I mean, so much of what Pat Nixon did is erased because of that Watergate scandal. Um, and, and so many of these first ladies, you know, like Lou Hoover, everything that Lou and Herbert did, which was incredible, um, uh, you know, all of their like, oh yeah, depression, he couldn't do anything. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 um, it's it's strange. I mean, I I, get, I understand it. I mean, they're massive, uh, significantly uh, uh, occurrences in, in the history and things. But but you know, to have that just erase all the other stuff that they do, um, and and that's what that's that's another thing that I just loved about uh, writing these books and 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 doing this series and stuff was that you did when you when you dive deep in, you do get to find all. I mean, Rutherford B. Hayes you know the, the his his election was was uh fairly controversial you know we've been having uh election controversy you know way back as well and and a lot of things that happened during his uh presidency or or uh you know the civil war during abraham lincoln and civil or, or the post civil war that happened in the in the um uh, the, the grant administration. There's so many things that happen in the world that sort of take away from the stuff that they're actually doing, you know, uh, the, the, the everyday stuff. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to, to bring that stuff up and highlight it. Great. Well, excellent. Well, why don't we wrap it up? We um, run around for a little while. If anyone has any links or information or speakers or anything. Grace uh, Coolidge would be another, Sharon. I'm seeing Sharon message. Grace Coolidge, she's the first lady of baseball. Man, did I have a oh, good yeah, time in Big Vermont. Boston Red Sox fan. Yeah, she's a Red Sox fan and a Washington Senators fan <laughs> when she was in Washington, D.C. She was also the scorekeeper of her Vermont University uh, baseball team. She, she's been a baseball gal from, from, from the very beginning. But uh, but I digress. It's it's fascinating, also, Robert, to see that there's still almost 300 people on here still still listening and with questions and things. Please, folks, you know, connect with me on 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 social media and go to firstladiesman.com. I'd love to continue the conversation. I'd love to uh, uh, sign some books for you, answer your questions, and everything. I'm completely accessible and just 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 humbled and and grateful for the uh, for the for the interest and and the support here. Oh, yeah. So I put Andrew's in contact information also in the event description, and I'll also email it out as well. And then likewise, like I said, if anyone has, I one thing I like about doing these programs, I really learn a lot myself. And um, if anyone has any um, uh, resources of First Ladies or anything like that, feel free to email it to me. My email is in the invitation that has the Zoom link in it. So again, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month to learn more about Lou Hoover. And that was the First Lady's man, Andrew Oak. So thanks everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your weekend. And we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Great to be here with you all today. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Bye-bye.